this. We're here for what this right here. Yep. And change to live. Or something. Not yet, has it? They're starting right now. Here we are. Okay, folks, for those of you who happen to be on YouTube with me, we'll be starting in about 25, 25 seconds, okay? 25 seconds, Roy, you on Facebook. 15 seconds before you're on, before you we start on WebEx. We are streaming on all three, all three areas right now. And it's the first time to try this. Mm. First time to do all three. Mm -mm. You've done it before. Okay, folks, the Word of God is alive and powerful. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, dividing, and sunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow as a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly, rightly dividing, dividing the, the word, word of truth. truth. And we always say, Steve, that what? The spiritual spin stops right, right here, here because, because we, we really care, care for, you. for you. Go ahead and pray for us. <laughs> Father, we do know that you care for us so much that you sent your son down on the cross to give us eternal life and salvation. You also gave us a spiritual way of life to live, and it's our job to learn it, understand it, and live in it. So help us sharpen those skills tonight as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, Steve, I'm going to go get our document because we're going to be in phase two, part two, of the concept of human good. Let's go back and uh, beget, go back and review for just a moment the uh, some points that we made last week just to bring it all into context so point number one was what human good is defined as the production of the believer who is functioning in the cosmic system which is Satan's system okay now hang on there for just a minute folks you need to get you need to get that under understanding we're talking about human mm -hmm. good and that's not good it's not good for the Christian it's not good for the uh, for the unbeliever so human good, again, is defined as the production. That means the works, the deeds, the service of the believer. We're not talking about the unbeliever right now. The production of the believer who is functioning in the cosmic system, which is Satan's system. And we're going to help you to understand one more time what that system is. Go ahead, Steve. Well, the term cosmic system refers to Satan's strategy to rule the world. Anything mm -hmm. and everything that distracts a human being away from God the Father's plan to use the human to to use the human beings to resolve the angelic conflict is related to Satan's strategy. Okay, so here here we're talking about a cosmic system. And that cosmic system is actually Satan's strategy. strategy. Well, what's what's the the issue with his strategy? What he's wanting to do since he was back there in eternity past, there came a point in time in eternity past where he said, "Hey, look, I need to take over here, okay? His beauty, his wisdom, hey, he was arrogant, so he says, I think I'll just take over. And what he wants to do now is to rule the world with his system called, they were calling it the, his strategy, and his strategy is for human beings to produce human good, believing that somehow or another that's going to please God, okay? So, we're we're in, and the reason he's using human beings is to resolve the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. So what, where are we going from here? Well, we're going to have some terms. Here are some terms that are related to the cosmic system, Satan's, uh, which is Satan's strategy to rule the world. Okay, now now hang on. Where where are we going with this? We're going to take a look at some some Term. terminology. And I thought, you know, I want to put this in here again because many people who are not learning the Word of God, pastors being politically correct or whatever, and it's a majority of them. There, there are several several pastors across the country that are teaching doctrine. But for the most part, pastors are doing whatever they're doing, being politically correct, don't upset the apple cart, I need a job, I need to pay, whatever. But the truth of the matter is, is that in terms of our study of this thing called the angelic conflict, our study of this concept called human good, we need to understand some terminology. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm going to do is we're going to give the terminology, and then as we move into the study tonight, these terms are going to come, come up. up. Uh -huh. So, one at a time, and just read them uh, read them out loud here for us. Cosmic one. That's the arrogance complex. Okay, so we, we need the term cosmic one, and what you need to think of is every time we say cosmic one, 
we're talking about an arrogance complex of sins. Remember the word concept, the co complex means a building structure, okay? So what you're doing is you don't just have a foundation. You've got a whole structure of, of arrogant issues that will take you out of the plan of God and place you as a believer in carnality, which means you're not you're worthless to God at that point in time. So when you hear cosmic number one, think arrogance. When you hear arrogance, think cosmic number one, okay? Now, what's number two? Cosmic number two is the hatred complex. So what happens is Satan has two systems. And what you, if you'll stop long enough, you will actually see these two things at work today. Basically, the uh, I guess more fundamentally, uh, today, what we're doing is when you take a look at government, what you see, and, and actually, Steve, not just not in our government, but if you'll take a look at what's going on on the street today and the lividness regarding Christianity, our Constitution and our Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence, guess what? Those people are hating us. You understand that? They're hating us. So when you're hating some, when you're hating Christianity, when you're hating God, when you're hating Christians, when you're hating the Word of God, guess what? These people with that hatred, that's a part of Satan's strategy to mm -hmm. control the world because when you're hating or you're arrogant, you're not functioning in God's system to resolve the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. So think this. Cosmic one, arrogance. Cosmic number two, hatred or antagonism toward anything. Mm -hmm. That smacks of God, okay? Yes. Second, the third term. Old man and old woman. We need to find, we, we need to understand what, what this old man and this old woman are. Even for born again Christians, you need to make sure you understand this. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the next one? The sphere of the flesh. The sphere of the flesh, okay? And the antithesis of that is the sphere of the what? Spirit. The sphere of the spirit. So, sphere of this flesh, that is a place where you reside right. in carnality right. under the, under the, uh, uh, under the function of your old Man. sin nature, producing human good and personal sins. Okay, so the next term then we have is what? Human good. That is our subject. Mm -hmm. And there are three ways that you can commit that you can actually produce human good. We need to understand this. Mm -hmm. What are they? Philanthropy, human humanitarianism. And altruism. Okay, so there are three terms. Mm -hmm. And I say, and, and in the interest of time, if you don't know what those two words mean, just pick up your iPhone and ask Siri. Yeah, She'll yeah, tell yeah, you. Yeah. Humanitarianism, yeah, yeah. philanthropy, and altruism. And if you don't know, if you don't have a, an iPhone with Siri or somebody else on there to answer your questions, then just go, yeah, Google it or go get your dictionary mm -hmm. and look up those three words because every one of those are involved in producing human good, which is of absolutely no value to God and the plan in terms of resolving the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. So there are several terms, again, that, we're go that are going to come up here tonight. So let's, uh, let's, ask, let's go on to the next point then, okay? Human good is motivated by the believer functioning in any one of the ten gates in the cosmic one or nine gates of the cosmic two. Okay, so here's here's the issue again. Uh, human good is motivated by something, but it's it's motivated by you and me, we as born again Christians who are functioning in either the cosmic in cosmic number one, that's the arrogance complex, or cosmic number two, which is the hatred or the antagonism context uh, um, complex. And actually, last week we actually showed in, in the interest of time again. Just go back and get the notes from last week, and you'll see there are ten gates, ten different ways, and there are more. I'm sure more ways to get into this arrogance factor to take you out of God's plan for resolving the spiritual battle and placing you under the influence of Satan, who's trying to control the human race in the angelic conflict. So cosmic number one has ten gates. Cosmic number uh, or cosmic number two has nine gates, and again, those were in, in last week's lesson. Now, I was trying to. There's one more point down there, Steve. So let me. I'm sorry for those of you on on Webex. I mean, on uh, on uh, YouTube. Just go ahead and read that, Steve. <clears throat> According to Hebrews six one, human good originates inside the cosmic system and is dead works, and that's works that are not consistent with God the Father's plan. Absolutely, Hebrews six one pretty clear about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's uh, uh, anytime anytime someone's producing human good, 
they're actually producing dead works. And what that means is these are of absolutely no value to God in the, in the resolution of the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. And I would suggest to you that as a born-again Christian, you might wake up someday and figure out why you are under such pressure, which be the self-induced misery, the warning, the intensified discipline, and then ultimately the sin of death. All that is is God trying to get your attention that you're functioning in, in precisely the wrong way. Okay, I'm sure we'll get to this later, but these are the works that will, at the Bema seat, be burned up for the boy. We're, we're going there. No, we're going there. We're yeah. going. Yeah, we're going there. Yeah. Absolutely. So the next point regarding uh, regarding human good, and we're going to start to look at some verses now, Steve. Human good is related to the cosmic system, resulting in boasting. And okay, found so the two verses. Yeah. So what happens is, is when you when you realize that you're operating in Satan's cosmic system and you are producing human, human good, good, you need to realize that there are many people who are produce, producing this human good, and guess what they're doing? They're looking at everybody else and saying, hey, look what I'm doing. Both. So um, um, one of my mentors used to say it this way. The, when, when a person gives a testimony, you, listen to this. When a born-again Christian is giving a testimony, what you need to realize is, are they, are they talking about what Jesus Christ or God the Father has done for them, <laughs> or is this what they are, what they have done and are doing for God, which becomes not a testimony but a bragamony. <laughs> it's a bragamony. So what happens is we realize here that when you're living inside the cosmic system, oftentimes this will result in boasting. Listen to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, now let's stop and look at that again. Wow. Because here it is, for, uh, for by grace are you saved. We need to understand what grace is. Grace is God's, God's provision. provision. And God hasn't provided a means of salvation whereby you're going to do something that is meritorious, like Christian service, uh, uh, works, or good deeds. That doesn't save anybody. What this says here is for by grace, God's provision, are you saved? And that spiritual salvation that's going to keep you from going to hell and ultimately then onto the lake of fire. So what we need to do then is to find out what God's grace provision is for us for salvation and implement that in our life so that we will have that eternal salvation and which results in eternal security. Now watch this for a minute. For by grace are you saved through faith. Now watch this. And that not of yourselves. Now what we're seeing here then is many people are taking that phrase and not and that not of yourselves and you have to realize which which word back there that this is relating to. Is it relating to grace or is it relating to faith? Now, what many people do is because the word faith is closer to that phrase yeah. and that not of yourselves, they're saying, okay, for I'm saved by, by grace am I saved through faith that wasn't of myself. Therefore, God had to give me the faith in order to do it. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is you're born with all the faith you need. You're born with all the faith you're ever going to receive. You have it. Now the question is, are you going to implement that or not? So we need to realize that that phrase, and not of yourselves, then it goes on to say, it is a gift of God. See, it's not the faith that's the gift of God. This goes all the way back to salvation, which is a gift of God that comes to you through his grace provision. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The grace provision is actually Christ going to the cross and a non-meritorious faith coming from, coming from you that will actually result in eternal salvation. Now, let's read that whole verse again. Just read it clear to the end. <clears throat> For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, now what we see here is not of works, lest any man should boast. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to make sure that we understood what that word, what that word works means. Works there, not of works, lest any man should boast, but what are the works that you're doing there? What are they? Right there. They're human good. They're human good. <laughs> So, not of human good. Why? Lest any person should boast. 
Now let's move on to Romans Romans 4, 2 and see some more about this. For if, by Abraham, for if Abraham was justified by works, he hath thereof to glory, to boast, but not before God. Okay, now watch this. For if, a, if Abraham was justified by works, let me ask a question, was he? No. No, he wasn't. <laughs> so if he wasn't, then what that means is, is that that word if is, is if and he's not. If he's not. It's a second class condition, which means for if Abraham were justified by works and he was not, and he's not yeah. but if he were, uh -huh. if he were justified by works and, it, it would, and if it were true that that's the case, then he would have, he would, he have whereof to boast, to glory. And that word glory there, here we've got it down here. The word glory means what? Boast. Boast. So he would, he would have, he would have whereof to, to boast. Uh -huh. But watch this. He's not boasting before God because that's not correct. He would be boasting before whom? Other people out there. Huh? Absolutely correct. Well, that's kind of like the word boasting. He's glorying in it. That's almost oh, the same yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So the issue here is we've seen in this particular, this issue here, that human good related to the cosmic system results in boasting. Yeah. And by the way, you can only produce human good from the cosmic system, either cosmic one, the arrogance complex, or from the hatred complex or the antagonism complex, which is cosmic number two. Doesn't make any difference where you are in any of these 10, ten issues, uh, gates to get into the arrogance, or nine over here to get into the hatred complex, whatever good you're doing is human good. And here you are, this gives you the capacity to boast, but you're not boasting to God, you're boasting toward our fellow man, okay? Now, there's another uh, another uh, thought here, and we're going to expand on that. Go ahead. Well, if a human being could be saved by works, that person would have to have cause for boasting. Does that make any yeah. sense? Yeah, if we could do it, we could boast about it. Then. Absolutely. And, and, and let me tell you what, Steve. Uh, I've used an illustration in the past, and I'm gonna, I am gonna—I don't know whether I've used it where you, in your presence or not, but I'm going to give it to you tonight and give it to the folks that are out here and ask if this makes any sense to you. For example, and I please understand, I know where some of my friends are coming from yeah. who actually believe that you have to be, you have to be baptized to be saved, okay? Now let me, let me, uh, let me uh, offer a scenario here and see what your thoughts are about this. If in fact you had to be baptized in water to be saved, faith, faith in Christ plus water baptism, that would result in in spiritual salvation. My question is this. If we see here in these two passages that we had just a moment ago, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and then he goes on, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Romans 4, 2, you're boasting before, you're boasting before man, not before God, because God isn't accepting that kind of a thing. Now let's come down here then and ask ourselves this question. If in fact you you have to be baptized to be saved. First of all, believe in Jesus. Salvation is not going to come from God under this condition. You believe in Jesus. I'm looking now to be baptized. So if you've watched the baptismal services, okay, up the steps you come, you change clothes, get into the gown, and now the, you look down and the pastor is standing in the water, waist deep. And he looks up at you, he puts his hand up here like this, and you don't move. He says, come on, come on, come on down here, come on, come on. And then nothing happens. And finally, this person up here says, aha, uh -huh, tell you what, you've been telling me that all I had to do was believe in Jesus to be saved, but I'm telling you, I believe I have to be baptized in water to be saved. Therefore, I'm not going to get in there. Now watch this. If he says, I'm not going to get in there, then that means he can't be saved. <laughs> but he finally says, okay, I'm ready to get saved. Watch this. And he walks down into the water and claims salvation because he did something oh, yeah. going oh. down into the water. You see that? Mm -hmm. That's works. That's works. Mm -hmm. So in other words, when you stand up there and you have to be baptized in water, you just look down there and tell that, tell that guy down there, hey, no, no, I'm not going to do this. So I know I believed in Jesus, but since I have to go down here, this is going to be all about me. It's not always all about him. It's about the two of us. That's about as arrogant as you can get. It really is. Okay? <laughs> so with that in mind, let's read point one again here. If a human being 
could be saved by works, that person would have cause for boasting. Okay. Hey, I can do it. Okay. Now, how about point number two? Human beings can generate their own pseudo-happiness by boasting about their production. That's their works, their deeds, their Christian service. Okay. So, here again, human beings can generate their own pseudo-happiness. Yeah. Hey, look here. I mean, how much every, I've done for Jesus? every time I talk about me, oh, it makes me so happy because people are slapping me on the back. They're telling me five nice things about yeah. myself. All these kudos. Hey, you know, look at me. Well, that's a pseudo happiness. What that means is it's a false happiness because somewhere along the line, you're coming down. Oh, yeah. You're not going to get away with this. Well, how about point D? Human good produced while residing in either cosmic one, the arrogance factor, or cosmic two, the ag antagonistic factor is never acceptable to God, found okay. in Isaiah 64, 6. Okay, now hang on. We're coming up with a passage right here that's going to blow the minds of many, many people <laughs> that haven't ever heard this before. And um, so we're, we're talking about human good. And never. this is produced while you're residing in either cosmic one or cosmic two. So cosmic one is the arrogance complex. One of ten gates. You're in it. You're doing some of this. So here you are. You're in the cosmic comp uh, in the cosmic uh complex, arrogance factor, or you're out there in the hatred complex, you're antagonizing uh, antagonized, uh, uh, antagonizing Christians and God and everything else. So here you are, you're, you're out here, but you're producing human good from each one of those areas. Now, this is not always necessarily sinful. What you're doing is producing, producing human good from arrogance. You're producing human good from antagonism. I hate God, but I'm going out here in humanitarianism. I'm going to get out here and just help the world. I'm going to help old ages across the street. I'm going to feed the poor. I'm going to clothe the clothes. I'm going to give a homeless person a home. Okay, so that's all those wonderful things you're doing out there that are human good. But what you need to understand is what God says about all of your human good while you're functioning in either one of these complexes. Not both of them, just one of them. So here's what he says. We've, I've got a diagram here for those of you that are online with me. I've got a diagram where it says cosmic number one and cosmic number one is producing human good, but it's actually done in the sphere of the flesh. You see that? Cosmic number two, producing human, human good, good, but that's coming Always. from the sphere of the flesh. Now, I'm, I'm uh, tell you what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to... Um, I can, I can lean up a little bit. Let me, let me see. I, I, can lean, I can lean up. I can see it. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Let's do this. Yeah. Let me bring Let me bring the, uh, see if I can get the, uh, the computer closer to us, and maybe you can see over top of that. I can't read the Hebrew, though. No, I, <laughs> no I'm not going to. No, yeah, don't expect, do that to me. Don't expect you to see the Hebrew, read the Hebrew, but that's okay. Go right ahead. Isaiah 64, 6. Mm -hmm. But we all are as unclean Thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Okay, stop right there. That passage of scripture right there is absolutely mm. phenomenal. And I don't know anybody until I heard my mentor talk about this. And when I heard this probably 35 years ago, I said, wait a minute. I, let me take a look at this. This is when this is when I began to say, okay, I need to understand the Hebrew. I'd gone to seminary. I quit seminary because I felt like after one year at the seminary, they weren't teaching me what I needed to know. I wanted to teach the Word of God, but that's not what they were teaching me. They were teaching me how to prepare a sermon, how to evangelize, how to build a building, how to do this, nothing that would help the people that are sitting in the pew. So I said, okay. That's when I, start, I started, I, I, uh, I signed up for Hebrew classes at uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and I, I, I took my Hebrew from Oklahoma State, and then I took Greek from another, from another area, okay? So when I heard that, I said, by now, I've got this brown driver in Briggs. It's about, it's about that thick, you know, it's, and it's, it's the Hebrew, the Hebrew that's used in the Bible and talks just how these words are used uh, and gives you all the definitions and the way they're used grammatically. So what we have here on the screen here is actually the the entire Hebrew Hebrew uh, phrase or the Hebrew of that sixty four six Isaiah sixty four six. Now the interesting thing here is that when you read Hebrew, you read it from right to left, <laughs> just the opposite. Opposite. But here's what I found out: 
that when you copy it and paste it into a Word document, it comes out the other way. It comes out <laughs> left to right, okay? Yeah. So what happens is on the screen, I have the Hebrew, but that emboldened word right there, Steve, uh -huh. you see that emboldened word? Uh -huh. That is actually the word that's translated filthy here, okay? So what I want to do now is to go to the next page, and this is the same word. Mm -hmm. that was there in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And going when you go to Brown, Driver, and Briggs, which is the big, big dictionary yeah, right. regarding the Hebrew words, here's what it says. Brown, Driver, and Briggs says that word is actually a feminine noun, and the, and the definition of it is menstruation. Now, don't let that blow your mind. Mm -hmm. But there's a reason why that. He, what, he's, what he's actually saying, Steve, is this. Let's go back and take a look at that again. When we read that, when we read that verse, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousnesses are as menstrual rags. You got that? Mm -hmm. Now let's move on. Let's move on back to where we were. Let's let's see an application of that word. All of our deeds are like menstrual rags. Now what he's talking about is all this human good that you're doing. This is an unbeliever. Okay. All of our human good. Now, the same thing would be true of a believer, but what happens is when you're out there producing human good, which is not what God wants you to do, and we'll see what he wants you to do here in just a little while. So let's read the application of that verse. The person who resides in the cosmic system, system one or two, and produces human good is like a woman who is ceremonially unclean and the human good is like her menstrual rags, meaning totally unrighteous. You see that? What do I want you to say? Like when it says our righteousness, that's in our human good. That's self-righteousness. Like self-righteous, like the best we can come up with is dirty. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's the best we in our own strength, our own human good. We better get uh -huh. we better get this idea. Obviously, we know our bad stuff is bad, but when they think the best we can is to in the eyes of God is that bad. Any any human good that without you do, is without regard to whether things, well, just a little bit, just a whole lot, so yeah, and over the top. No, human good, human good for the believer and unbeliever is like the menstrual rags of a woman, filthy, dirty, and, that, and it means totally unrighteous. And say that'd be like somebody's like the unbeliever, or somebody not trying to understand this. You mean all that wonderful philanthropy that is? Does that? Filthy in the eyes of God, they could hardly understand it. it well, so we're going to them. we're going to we're going to yeah. see that they uh -huh. can't understand the things of God. Mm -hmm. They're spiritually discerned, mm -hmm. and without the Holy without the Holy Spirit on the inside, they can't understand it. Okay. Okay. So now we say now now what happens is when you read this do this read this verse. Uh -huh. um, let's see. Well, yeah. uh, start right here here, and then when you get to the three dots, jump all the way down here and continue okay. the verse. And all our righteous deeds are like menstrual rags. And all of us who produce human good while residing in the cosmic system wither like a leaf. And our perverities, our perverted, per perversities. perversities are like the wind. And they blow us away to the sin and the death. So when you say so all this, all this is blown away, you know, and it's uh, tantamount to the sin and the death. Okay, so now what happens is we move on to, to point E. Bottom line, human good will not provide salvation. Titus 3, 5. Now, so, yes, let's stop and listen to what we said. Because unless you're beginning to understand now a little bit about what human good is. Human good is good that's being produced by your old man or your old woman, woman under the influence of the old sin nature while you're residing in the sphere of the flesh. I know that's a lot to absorb, but when you come up, come back. And that's why, Steve, I said we need to learn terminology uh -huh. because when we learn terminology, it helps to put together the, the, the pieces of the puzzle, okay? So human good, you said, will not provide salvation. Better listen to me. Because those out here today who believe that you get saved by some form of works. And then what happens is they say, okay, but these works that I'm producing is part of the grace of God. He told me that's what I'm supposed to do. Well, no, it isn't. Not at all. So human works will not provide, N-O-T, underlined and boldened, will not produce salvation. Titus 3, 5 says what? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Okay, now watch this. 
what we need to understand here. It's not by works of righteousness. So all of your Christian deeds, all of your Christian production, all of your Christian whatever, well, here again, that it's not going to be, uh, can't be Christian. It's got to be unchristian, an unbeliever. But all of that good that you're doing is not going to produce salvation, even if what you're doing is doing the rules or the 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 uh, uh, the commands that a Christian is supposed to do. Okay, so here you are you're an, you're an unbeliever, but you're doing all these things that God commands the Christian to do. So, well, hey, you know, I've done all this. Apparently, I will be saved. Well, what you have to do is you've got to make a distinction between what the word righteous means, and we're going to see that in just a moment. So here, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, the question is, what uh, yeah. kind of righteousness is this? And this is why we study the Word of God categorically. So the word righteousness comes from the Bible, but when you study from Genesis to Revelation and pull all the information together on this term, on the subject of righteousness, what we're going to find out is that word righteousness can be interpreted in several different ways. And you have to make sure that you're interpreting it and making an application of the right word for the circumstance of life. Here we're talking about salvation. So this righteousness actually means what? This is self-righteousness producing human good. Okay, so what this means is not by our self-righteousness that produces human good, which we have done. So righteousness then is self-righteousness producing human good, okay? Now, let's talk about this for just a moment because there are at least four, there are four different kinds of righteousness. Stop and listen to me. Please stop and listen to me. There are four different kinds of righteousness. So when you're you're going through the Bible and you say, hey, righteous here. Oh, here's another word, righteous there. Oh, righteous here. Oh, righteous over here. Oh, righteous over here. And then you say, oh, yeah, I guess if there's only one meaning, you think you know what that means. But you had better be able to understand that there are four different kinds of righteousness spoken in the Word of God. And what you have to do is to make a distinction when you read the word righteous, righteously, or any form of that, which, Which one of these are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what? there are four different kinds of righteousness. What are they? First one is self-righteousness. What that's, is self-righteousness? Well, that's the unbeliever's human good. Hold on, yeah. That's the unbeliever's human good. Okay, how about this? Positional righteousness. What is, what is that? That's the saved. That's the righteousness you have when you become yes, saved. Right. The moment you get saved, you are positionally Position righteous. Right. And by the way, I, I should have I and could have done this. For self-righteousness... Self-righteousness can be produced not just by a believer, uh, yeah. but it can be produced by a, uh, a, I a mean, an unbeliever. Okay. It can be produced by a believer I, I and, that, and yeah. I thought, well, maybe we're just talking about that. Well, no, I did, I did that to see. <laughs> well, yeah. I started to say something. I'm glad you brought that back yes. up. Yeah. So self-righteousness can be produced by right. a believer and, and an unbeliever. unbeliever. And, and so what that means is you're actually producing righteousness from outside the sphere of the, uh, the sphere of the spirit. Right, exactly. Both of them. The Both unbeliever them. is operating outside the sphere of the spirit, and the unbeliever can't operate anywhere but outside. That's and he's exactly. not saved. So both of them are self-righteous. So any human good that's being produced by a human mm -hmm. being, mm -hmm. it's, that's it, right. it's self-righteous. Okay, so for the second kind of, of oh no, we well, said, we talk about positional righteousness. That's uh, when you're saved at the cross. Positionally, we were at the cross. There. Absolutely, we there physically, but, but it's absolutely. But here's the issue. You were in Adam, Adam. And Adam. Mm -hmm. at the moment you were born physically. Yeah, there you go. The moment you're born again, yeah. you are placed in, in union with Jesus Christ. And guess what? God the Father imputes Jesus. His absolute right. righteousness to your to your uh, to your human spirit. Mm -hmm. So now you are positionally, positionally righteous. righteous. But while you're positionally righteous, you may not be experientially righteous. You're positionally righteous, and guess what? You're you're just as carnal as you can be. Uh -huh. Still doing the same old things, okay? Which and brings that up. The next one is experiential righteousness. And Say that again. Experiential righteousness. Okay, and what is experiential that's, that's righteousness? That's residing in the sphere of the spirit. That's right. It's Which only so, a believer can do. So when, you are, when you're functioning in the sphere of the spirit, then you can produce experiential, experiential righteousness. righteousness. It's when you do the truth from the sphere of the spirit, spirit rather than from the sphere of the flesh. Listen, this is the Christian way of life. Mm -hmm. This is not flim flam. This is not just make up and make up your own way and just do a whole lot of good and somehow or another. And can you imagine this? To believe 
that anybody in any religion outside of Christianity could possibly do enough good to get saved, that is, I mean, that just boggles my mind when pastors make that kind of a statement. Well, Mahatma Gandhi or somebody else over here, somebody else over here, somebody else over here from a world religion. You see people saying, um, um, you know, they're Meditate, meditating and everything. Oh, they're just fine people. They're not, oh, excuse one me. with the world. And <laughs> Some, yeah, somehow or another, that's supposed to be good and good enough. Well, they're not doing anything wicked and wild and woolly. Look here, they're at the top of the mountain, you know, doing all this stuff. No, excuse <laughs> me. Still doesn't feel filthy rags. Doesn't make any difference where you are. That's menstrual rags. That's exactly right. So that's experiential righteousness when you're when you're as a born again Christian, you are you're saved, you're clean before the Lord through rebound, one John one nine, you're functioning in operation cry, no reckon reckon and yield, Romans six, 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 eleven, six, thirteen. And when you yield to the Holy Spirit as the fourth step of operation cry, bingo, you're now in the sphere of the spirit and you are experientially spiritual. And guess what? From there you apply the truth and you're gonna have you're gonna produce another kind of good that we'll be talking about here shortly, okay? So uh the last the last kind of uh, uh, ultimate righteousness. And that's, what is that? That's, that's right after the beam of seat judgment. You see, excuse me, <coughs> because your your uh, your your holy the spirit has already been been saved and indwelt by the uh, by the by the Holy Spirit, and you have absolute righteousness mm -hmm. imputed to your to your human spirit. So that's okay. <coughs> then what happens is, as you're living out the Christian of life after you get saved. The requirement, the obligation, the command to born-again Christians is to become exactly like the character of Christ in his humanity as he would have lived here on planet Earth. Sinless, free from sin. We are to progress to that point. Don't argue with me about whether we're ever going to get there or not. We have the command to get there, to do it. And I don't want to serve a God that commands me to do anything that he hasn't given me the capacity to do. You follow that? That's right. So here we go. Ultimate righteousness. So what that means is, here you uh, when you when you go out the when you go out the door of death, maybe you were carnal for the larger portion of your Christian way of life. But the truth of the matter is, you're going to be raptured. Now you have a resurrection body which is perfect. You have the you have the uh, the um, the absolute righteousness imputed to your human spirit. So body, soul, and spirit. Body is a resurrection body. You have uh, absolute righteousness imputed to your human spirit. The only thing left is your soul, and what happens is while you're in time, as you are progressing and uh, growing toward maturity, what you're doing is you're delivering your soul from the old the old man, old man, old woman lifestyle. <clears throat> but at the same time now, when you get to the Bema seat, the only thing left to, to be handled is your human, human good. <laughs> Your human good. Some people bring a big bag of it with them. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And that's gonna and your human good will be dealt with at the at the bema seat of Christ. Someone says, Well, what's the bema seat? We're coming there too, okay? Now we see then four different kinds of righteousness. So in this verse, go back here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Read that again and tell me what righteousness we're talking about. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. Okay, and what kind of righteousness is that? Self righteousness. Self righteousness. It's unbeliever and believer, human good. Right. Okay, now, the person, the person residing in the cosmic system, whether it's cosmic one or two, mm -hmm. contends that faith alone is not enough for salvation. See, the person living in that, oh, yeah, yeah. and there's 90% yeah, plus, I'm telling you, 90% uh, plus of people who claim to be Christians in the United States of a day, and I believe it's even worse around the world, yeah. but in the United States of a day, today, 90% plus between 90 and 91 are actually believing that we have to produce some kind of works to be saved. in order to be saved. You're going to have to produce works after you're saved or you're going to get the you're going to get the knock uh -huh. on your door, you know, the, uh -huh. the tension getters. But that's the result of something that is you're doing those because of something that's already happened to your life salvation without works that you produce those fruits. We can say that again. In other words, like so you're not baptized to save you. You're you may be baptized, but it just shows as a oh, result yeah. of something you've already been already, saved. Already. It just shows something you that, that 
picture of what you've already done. Absolutely. Nothing to do with saving you. That's exactly right. <clears throat> so the person living in the cosmic system, go ahead, contends again. What that regard- faith alone is just not enough for salvation. Yeah, so faith alone and Christ alone, just believing in him. Well, that's too that, easy. you got to do something. Boy, I was just going to say right. that too, Steve. I've heard that a jillion times. Uh-huh. Well, that's just too easy. My comment? Argue with God. Yeah, that's yeah. his plan, not mine. Faith alone in Christ alone. He... <laughs> all we are, all we are, is voice, uh, you know, uh, voices for him. Okay. So moving on from there for just a well, moment. Well, uh, whole denominations even are built on living one's life inside the cosmic system and performing human good. Yeah. Okay. Now, ritual. now sort, now sort of look up, look up there, Steve, and see if you can read the verse. Okay. <laughs> Second Timothy one nine. Not according to our works, human good but according to his predetermined plan, okay. even grace. Yeah. See, so what happens it is... clear right there. It, uh, it pretty clear, isn't it? Not according to our, our works. works. That, listen, if that, that works. That word means anything Any, at all that you're doing mm-hmm. in order to get saved, whether it's baptism, speaking uh-huh. in tongues, walking an aisle, repenting, feeling sorry for your sins. See, when I say repent, got to be careful there yeah. because repent actually means two words, metamelamai and metanoel. Uh-huh. Two words. Met, met, uh, metanoeo, it actually means uh, to uh, to change your mind. So when you're out here believing that, hey, if I just worship, worship the fish, if I worship the totem pole, if I do this, if I do that, uh, hey, I'll be saved. No, excuse me. No, and that's not it at all. So, um, change your mind. You, you, change you, your yeah, mind. repent means to change, change your, your mind. mind and what that. you're doing, change your mind on what... The, what actually going to yes. constitute salvation? salvation. Mm-hmm. You're changing your mind about what God says in His Word. I used to believe totem poles. Hey, that's fine. <laughs> or just uh, uh, you know, doing real, doing mm-hmm. real good. No, 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 no. That's not it at all. It means to change your mind away from what you thought was going to save you to, to believing Jesus. that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. He died. He was buried and resurrected for your, for your, for your salvation. Just simply believe in Him. Now, metamalami, that word, that word means feel sorry, but that's what Satan did when he got caught, you know. I mean, uh, Judas, when, he, when he, he betrayed Jesus, he, he, he was sorry. He felt sorry for what he did, okay? So metamalami means to feel sorry for your sins. He repented, okay? He felt sorry. He didn't get saved. This metanoeo, metanoia is the noun. It actually means to change your mind, believing that only through Jesus Christ, faith alone in him will save you. Other than what you were believing. You're Absolutely, you're yes. Okay, now that takes care of that, that page. Let's move on to the next one. Now, the predetermined plan. See, uh-huh. he, let's go, I'm sorry, let's go back there and take a look at that one more time. I'll go down to the bottom of the page. And you'll slip up there again. And I'll take care of this next week because I didn't realize yeah. that we're going to have this problem. Well, the last part of that verse, well, I'll just say the whole thing. Not according to our works, human good, mm-hmm. but according to his predetermined plan, yes. even grace. See, his predetermined, plan, his predetermined plan is grace. Uh-huh. He's the one that decided in eternity past, predetermined plan. That means determined ahead of time. He didn't wait for you to come down here and say, Paul, I don't feel good. There's something wrong with my life. He said, well, just a second now. Oh, let me think of something here. <laughs> yeah, let, yeah let, let me think of a plan here. No, it was predetermined. That was pre- Listen, this plan was determined before he ever created anything, before he created the angels, before he created the universe, before he created man, okay? Now, with that in mind... Wow. Let's move on. By the way, we used to talk about Operation Guam. When you're talking about uh, the order of creation, Uh uh, we talk about Operation Guam. That's what I learned. But it really wasn't Operation Guam. God has always been, then the universe, then the angel, then man. No, it's God has always been. Then we had the creation of angels. Angels Angels were present when he created the universe, and then man. So it's not Guam, it's Gaum. Yeah, that has to be first. (laughs) Yes, that's right. Okay, so moving on. Not that's not meant to be critical. It's just that I think it's it's clear. Okay, whoops, wrong direction. Uh, let's see. Here we go down one more page. Yeah. Now let's move on here. Point F. Human good has no place in the plan of God. Found in First Corinthians thirteen verses one and three. One Actually, three. now here's what we have. I got three verses here, Steve. So um, what I want to do is I've got a break between each verse. And what each verse is going to say is this. Here's some things that you, you're doing. Mm-hmm. Paul says, these are the things I'm doing. 
But what we want to see is what he says about the things Thanks. that he's doing at the end of that verse. Uh -huh. So at the end of each of these verses, what you're going to do is he's going to give you a whole list of things that he's doing that's really humanly good. But the question is, what about all that, okay? Mm -hmm. So 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. If I speak with eloquence of men and of angels, but I have no love, I become no more than a blaring brass or a clashing cymbal. A blaring ba brass and crashing cymbal. Okay, so what it, what it amounts to is a blaring brass and a crashing cymbal make a whole lot of noise. Oh, but no. oh it's just, oh boy, that really... So if, if you're speaking with the eloquence of angels, men of angels, but you don't have love. See, that's the issue. You don't have love. I become no more than blaring brass and a crashing cymbal. And the speaking with the eloquence of, eloquence of men and of angels, that's human good. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, look at the, My the, talent, my oratory skills. Yeah, know. ready to boast about all this. He said, hold it just a second. He said, oh, you're doing it. You, you might as well <laughs> blow your horn and beat the cymbal. It's just noise. Yeah. That's all it is. Scratchy okay, then he goes on and says what? I have the gift of foretelling the future and, and hold in my mind not only all human knowledge, but the very secrets of God. And if I also have that absolute faith which can move mountains, but I have no love, I amount to nothing at all. See? Human good. Yeah, all this that I'm doing, what? but I don't have love. Yes, yeah, it's done for the wrong reason, the wrong it's motivation. Motivation, that's uh -huh. right. Uh -huh. I, he said, I amount to nothing, nothing at all. Uh -huh. So all this that you've done, the foretelling the future, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, holding your mind not only human knowledge, but all the secrets of God. He said, if you don't have faith, yeah, and right even have faith, it can move mountains, okay? But have not love. Now, the third, the third verse. If I dispose of all that I possess, yes, <laughs> even I give my own body to be burned, but I have no love, I have achieved precisely nothing human good. Can you imagine that? Go all I mean, out. Just get rid of, oh, yes, get rid of everything. Out. Well, some might say, oh, I don't have very much, so it won't make any difference. I give all I but, have. But if you, just, if you were wealthy uh -huh. and you gave it all away, and some of these things could be the right thing, but for the wrong reason, yeah. the wrong motivation, all human good. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. So ha doing all this, so what we see is three examples of human good mm -hmm. in this verse. And what he says is when you're done, he said it is nothing. It is worth Zero. nothing to God. Zippo. That's it. That's exactly right. We'll see that later on, I'm sure, about that when mm -hmm. we get to the Bible scene. Mm -hmm. Okay, human good is the product of the cosmic system, the production of satanic-like arrogance, or Satan-like antagonism towards grace. Okay, let's stop here again for just a moment. We're talking about human good, and said it's the product of the cosmic it's system. Remember, the cosmic system, system is Satan's system strategy, system. and it started all the way back in the Garden, in the garden of Eden when, he, uh, when uh, he deceived Eve and Adam, followed right, followed right after him, right after, so they fell from the righteous position and guess what? They they achieved or acquired an old oh, sin nature. nature, and we're going to see that, we're going to see that the old sin nature uh, has been taken care of at the cross, but human good hasn't. And there will be a time, as you've been leading up to this, that, that there's going to come a time when God's going to deal with that human good. So once again, human good is the is the product of the cosmic system. How many how many complexes are there in the cosmic system? There's an arrogance complex. And there's the hatred complex. That's exactly right. So there are two. And, and uh, I've indicated how many, do you remember how many uh, How many ways to get into the arrogant com uh, complex? Ten. Ten. And how many in the hatred complex? Nine. Nine. It doesn't make any difference where, which one you're in. Mm -hmm. you're, the best you can do is to produce human good from there mm -hmm. that's worthless, worthless in the plan of God. So what we have to do is go back to the big yellow circle and mm -hmm. ask yourself, what is life all about? What's the big yellow circle? Angelic conflict. Angelic conflict. You're into it. And until that is understood, nothing in makes in, sense. None of this makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Well, no, you're not doing all this good. That's why humanitarian activity, philanthropy, and altruism. Look here. Somebody, somebody has has paid to bring the these thousand people that are coming through Mexico from all those southern uh, South American countries, wherever they're in Central America. Somebody's paid for all that. Yeah. There's a leader. Yeah. There's a leader in this thing that's leading these people toward the United States. So somebody thinks they're really doing good by by doing this. It, it's good if we can just get rid of the United States of America. 
You got that? Yeah, trying hard. Right? Absolutely. But we're on the winning side. Okay, <laughs> sure enough. So again, let's read that statement right there. Human good is the product, is the production of the cosmic system. Mm -hmm. The production of satanic-like arrogance or Satan-like antagonism toward grace, yeah. God's provision. See, he's arrogant. He, he's, he's arrogant, and that's what caused him to fall. I will, I, I will, will, I will, I will. Five I wills. And Isaiah 14, thir 13, and 14. And the fifth I will is magnificent. Oh, he God. said, I will be, be like, like the, the Most, Most High God. God. Yeah. Now, let, see, I have to ask a question again. If he's going to be yeah. like the uh -huh. Most High God, does he really want you to sin? No, no. God doesn't so, want us to sin. God didn't. Go ahead. God doesn't want us to sin. Therefore, so Satan doesn't want us to sin. I go, oh, oh, I can't believe that. So, well, you, you, see, you're absolutely right. And folks, you better get a hold of that. Because what he wants us to do. Because is, what you're going to see is you're going to see what happened. Man acquired an old sin nature, nature. and guess who gave it to them? <laughs> God gave it to them. So Satan is Satan. Satan like to stomp out sin. He'd like to stomp out sin. What he wants you to do is to do good independently oh, from God. God. There is his strategy. Mm -hmm. He's going to rule the world and make it good. Like all the philanthropists, altruistic people, humanitarian activity, whoever is funding this thing. And you see all, you see the, the number of people that are, that are funding things. They're funding, funding political parties mm -hmm. to, to do in this nation. Okay. Do away with Christianity. Do away with the do away with the uh, uh, with the Constitution. I'm, I'm working on a post right now. I may put it up tonight, uh, probably around midnight or something like that, or two o'clock in the morning. But I'm working on it uh, to show it's it's why people are squealing today. Who's squealing and why? Okay, we'll see that later. Could it be like like Satan looks down at the believer and says, "Whoops, that one accepted Christ as Savior, he's going to heaven, but I can make sure." He does nothing but do human good, so he gets the beam of seed. He may be saved, but it's going to go up and. Smoke. He's going to it, it, absolutely. You're right. See, see, he's going to try. He's going to try to make sure that the unbeliever Never does saved. human good, <laughs> and that the the believer does human good, mm -hmm. and both those are going to be dealt with later right. on. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, so now uh, okay. Let's, let's see, see. next um, deeds. Oh, next, yeah. yes, okay. Deeds that's works performed mm -hmm. by humans can only become divine good. When they they are performed inside the sphere of the spirit, only then. So, so what happens when you're talking about deeds? deeds you're talking about work. works or production of the Christian way of life. But when that's performed by human beings, it can only become, become divine, divine good uh -huh. when they're when these deeds are Done. performed inside, inside the sphere of the spirit. And if you don't know how to get there, you're in trouble. What happens this when you start getting the attention getter, Steve? Uh -huh. God says, look in the angelic company. You're outside of my plan. I want you. I love you. I uh -huh. care for you. I want you in here where you can be blessed and rewarded. Oh, blessed in time in spite of all that's yeah. going on, okay? Uh -huh. Rewards in eternity. Absolutely. So with that, and by the way, it doesn't make any difference. I'm not sure who's online with me out here. I just do see June Gallows on the bottom of that list. There's several on, online out here. I'm going to say to all of you on Facebook right now, all of you who happen to be on WebEx with me right now, all just down, go down the list. If you're a born-again Christian, you have the capacity to perform divine good that will that will be blessable in time, uh, rewardable in eternity. Term. And by doing so, you're inside the plan of God. God is on your side. He's gonna He's going to protect you. And when I say when He's gonna protect you and provide for you, it doesn't necessarily mean things are gonna go right for you. But you you'll see the blessing. You'll see the blessing and the peace that you have inside for doing the right thing in the right way. As we uh, as we are approaching. Uh, uh, spiritual adulthood and moving on towards spiritual maturity, we realize that the pressure increases in your life, but God has God has provision for you, and you can be blessed right smack dab in the middle of all that. Okay, now with that in mind, we've got we've got a green circle here. What's that green circle represent? That's when you're operating the sphere of the spirit. That's what it is, the sphere of the spirit. That's yes, exactly right. We got the black circle, which is the unbeliever. Flesh. That's Flesh. right. Flesh. We got the blue circle, which is being saved. Uh -huh. We got the green circle inside the blue circle, in the sphere that of means the spirit. in the sphere of the spirit, and all of them are inside the yellow circle, which is the conflict. conflict. Okay. Oh, 
So, so what that means is these deeds provided in, uh, being produced inside the sphere of the spirit. What is that? That's divine goods, divine good deeds. Those are good divine works, divine production, rewardable at the Bema seat. Absolutely. Now we got the next point. I think we can actually see there. So uh, go ahead. Let's do therefore, that. Therefore, I mean, there is a legitimate function of good, and that is called establishment good. See, we're yeah, going another, another different, different direction now. We're going another direction. So what we've said is there are four different kinds of righteousness, uh -huh. and there are three different kinds of good. good. And we need to make a distinction between one and the other uh -huh. two. And we need to make sure that when you're producing, which one you're producing or which one you're not producing. And this is the Christian way of life. It's not just going to listen to the music, going to Sunday school class, singing the choir, preaching a sermon now and then, whatever. No, no, no. You have to understand what the Christian way of life is really all about. So go ahead now, point G. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. We read it one more time. This is... There is a legitimate function of good, and it's called establishment good. Okay, so there's a legitimate function of which good. is for believers and unbelievers. We're going to see. Uh, we're going to. Yep, we're going to see. I that. know we're going. I, I won't get ahead of myself. I have a great thought about that. No, sure that we're going to cover it. No, so. what that means is you understand some things, Steve, and uh, okay. that's and you have and you haven't seen the notes, so yeah, you don't know where we're going. But that's yeah, right. good. Okay. So now here it is. There are three different uh -huh. categories uh -huh. of, of good. good. Three. Okay, and read what they are. Establishment good. Okay. Human good and divine good. Okay, now what we need to do is we need to know what you have to do to produce all these. Uh -huh. Because here's the here's the unbeliever. Listen, I'm telling you, I've seen unbelievers who were producing more that was right <laughs> than what some believers, unbeliever, uh, believers are. Uh -huh. And what you're going to see is when you understand what, what establishment good is, yes. you're going to see that there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands, maybe millions of Americans who are unbelievers who are actually producing establishment good when the church and many Christians are, are opposed to the things that are establishment oriented. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll uh, so what are those three? Establishment good, okay. human good, mm -hmm. and divine good. Okay, now let's go back for just a moment. What is our point? Let me come down to the bottom of the page again. What, what we're talking well, about. There is a legitimate uh, there is a legitimate function of good, and it's called establishment good. Okay, so we've... Out well, of the so, three. Uh -huh. Yeah, so here's the issue. Establishment good is legitimate. Uh -huh. Divine good is legitimate. Human good is illegitimate right. regarding the plan of God. Uh -huh. So what we want to do is we want to try to figure out then what this establishment good, good is, is because human good is established is actually a function of the unbeliever or believer who are operating in cosmic one or cosmic two. Okay, mm -hmm. that means they're in the sphere of the flesh. They're functioning from the source of their old sin nature, but the unbeliever then can actually produce establishment good. But what in the world is establishment good? Here we go. Well, establishment good is available to both the unbeliever and the believer. Okay, now I'm a, while you're reading that, the thought that the thought that came to my mind is this. Okay, so this is true. But people who are coming to Bible study, whether it's on WebEx, Facebook, uh -huh. YouTube, they hear that, and they may say, "Okay, I, I hear that," but they don't uh, they don't allow their minds to process that so that when they see this unbeliever out here who is functioning uh, it with establishment good you don't want to necessarily consider the fact that that person is a born again Christian right. that that kind of good could be good enough for salvation that's exactly because right because he's doing it from the source of the old man. old man that's exactly right so establishment good is available to both the believer and the unbeliever so Believer can do it. Uh -huh. Unbeliever can do it. Moving on from there. An unbeliever can produce establishment good, rewardable only in time, by functioning in any of the five laws of the divine establishment. Now, now notice here. Now, we want yeah, to make that's sure. interesting thought. Yeah, see, we want to make sure we understand this. Because when we talk about rewards, uh -huh. we generally think about Christian rewards and, out there, okay? Uh -huh, uh -huh. That's the way we use that term. Uh, in uh, would it be more like he receives blessing in time, but not no, he's rewarded well, he's there? yeah, but the blessing kind of, is a re he's, he's rewarded. rewarded. No, he's going to be rewarded. You're not going right. to get anything later on out of the deal. <laughs> no, sir. Well, yeah. we're going to see that. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> absolutely. So here again, the an unbeliever do what? That, say that again. Yeah. The unbeliever he can produce establishment good, and it's rewardable only in time mm -hmm. by function in any of the five laws of the divine establishment. That's right. Any or any or all of them. Yeah, there are five of them. Uh -huh. You can, be, you can be rewarded for functioning in one. Uh -huh. It may be two. 
maybe three, maybe four, maybe all five. You don't have to be doing it in all five. You can, you can be rewarded just by being involved in one. So let's take a look at this. Now listen to, listen to this. We're going to get an, we're going to get an example of this in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9. And let's find out what it is that the unbeliever can do to be rewarded in time. Okay. Go ahead. Well, Ecclesiastes 9, 9 teaches us that the unbeliever can be happy in his job, his marriage, Factors in the laws of divine establishment. Okay, now let's uh, let's These read. Are factors in the laws of divine. That's right. So read that one more time. See the unbeliever in, in Ecclesiastes nine nine. It teaches us that the unbeliever can be happy in his job or his marriage or any of the factors of the laws of the divine establishment. That's exactly right. He's been be happy okay. in that. So we're, we in in Ecclesiastes nine nine says, hey, if you're employed. You can find happiness there, is, and you can find, and you can find blessing and reward. That's one of the laws of and, and the same thing too about marriage, because employment and marriage are, are two parts of the, of the of the five parts of the yeah. laws of divine establishment. Okay, so here it is. You got a job. You're you you uh, you're, you're, you have a spouse. You're married. You can find happiness in that field. Now, doesn't mean you, you may have a job. And you're not happy. You can have a you can have a wife and you're not happy. That's your problem. Yeah. But you can. Function. But what he's saying is that um, an unbeliever who is employed, an unbeliever who is married, can find happiness. They can be they can be blessed and uh, be rewarded in time. And we're going to see what the reward is in just a moment. Okay. Therefore, what? Therefore, the unbeliever can have limited blessings by having a spouse. Attended by unconditional love. See, that's why I said you may be married and it's miserable. Yeah. But when you have unconditional love, what that means is each one to the other. If if one is making a mistake, the unconditional love takes care of that. You see, uh, it's uh, the the agape love may go. I mean, the the phileo love may go for a while, but the thing that keeps the marriage together for years and years and years and years and where you find yourself happy is because your unconditional love for your spouse will enable you to have reward in time, but not, it it doesn't profit you at all as far as eternity is concerned. Okay, second point here. God blesses anyone believer or unbeliever who obeys the laws of the divine establishment. Okay, now there's an O word right there. Read that word. That obeys. Obeys. Mm -hmm. So there are five laws of divine mm -hmm. establishment. They're out there. Mm -hmm. But if you're not obeying them, mm -hmm. if you're not obeying them, don't believe that God is going to bless your life or provide anything. See, here's where the God blesses anyone. See, the blessing and the reward are the same same thing, okay? that's We're using them that way. You follow that? Right. You asked that question a Peter while ago. Yes, right. We had reward up there, blessing down here. The same thing. You're gonna you're gonna receive something. You're gonna receive something from God. That's right. It's temporary and temporary in life. Right. Okay. Or until you lose the agape love, the unconditional love for one another, and it's gone. Okay. So God blesses anyone, believer or unbeliever, who obeys the laws of divine establishment. So what we need to do is make sure we understand what those oh. laws, of divine oh. establishment, happen to be. And what are they? Five of them. First one. Freedom. Second. Marriage. Third. Family. Fourth. Nationalism. And five. Employment. Employment. So there are the five laws of divine establishment. Yes, and I God has I. given us these laws, uh -huh. given these these um, these laws of divine establishment, establishment principles. Uh -huh. He's given us that in order to in order to, to, to see to it that the that human hu race. the human race and human history, history is concluded in the right That's way. Right. So listen, because of the because of the laws of divine establishment, they're going to exist until we get to the end of human history. So just understand this, that when you hear the arrogance, the hatred that's manifested toward Christians who are talking about God creating everything. Oh no, 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 no. You know there was a big there's a big bang back there in eternity past. Or better still, you know, uh, we've got these uh, got the oceans out here yeah. and and man man evolved, be, yeah, evolved from a fish coming out of the out of the sea, uh, from a monkey swinging from a tree. Excuse me. That's not what God says. So what we need to realize that the five laws of divine establishment were given to us by God to preserve human history so that the angelic conflict can be 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 uh, be one okay one, at the huh? end of, so here's the issue now we know that in a country 
like the United States of America, there may be a multitude of unbelievers who are functioning here that's extending this nation in the United States because they believe in freedom, which was going to come from the Constitution and the Bible. But as an unbeliever, they're, they're pro-freedom. They're pro-marriage between a man and a woman. They are, they are pro-family. And when you talk about pro-family, what you're talking about, pro-family in the sense of what God gave us parents to train children to grow to understand the Word of God and these establishment principles that are going to preserve, that are going to, uh, you know, continue human history to the resolution of the angelic conflict. So family, in that concept of family, what we have, God has, God has given authority to the parents to train children and some other things. We'll talk about that later. Then nationalism, that's patriotism. And we have a patriot. We have a Patriots conference coming up here on May the sixth, and I have an op I've been asked to speak at that conference, given forty five or fifty minutes. It'll be in Hot Springs, Arkansas. It's being hosted by uh, Pastor Mark Goad and uh, Pastor Brad West, and uh, it'll be at the uh, the convention center in Hot Springs. It's a Saturday, from about nine o'clock in the morning until sometime late afternoon. Uh, be several speakers during that day. And it's going to be focused on patriotism. So I'm in the process now of putting my message together regarding that. And it can be biblically, biblical, it can be constitutional, historical, etc. But it has to do with patriots in this day and age. Nationalism is patriotism. And uh, by the way, this would indicate how can you have a nation if you don't have boundaries? Stop. You better listen to me out here. It's just a blob. You better <laughs> listen to me. Uh -huh. See, that's globalism. Uh -huh. What we need is get rid of the borders. We're just going to have one, one world. world government, uh -huh. you see? Uh -huh. But in the meantime, if you as an American, if you want to preserve freedom so that we can be free to worship uh, as we desire, freedom to evangelize the lost, freedom to uh, send out missionaries, uh -huh. freedom to be a friend of Israel, and you see in every one of those areas, Steve, we, we have the unbeliever, the cosmic believers, and the cosmic, uh, the cosmic unbelievers are trying to shut down freedom, to, moving toward government control, ty tyranny, uh, shutting down, uh, opening up. Uh, forget about this thing about marriage, when man and woman. How about two, two men, two women? Uh, Distortion. Uh, oh, absolutely, the whole thing. Nationalism, get rid of the Constitution. Uh, uh, ex excuse me. And uh, hey, forget about job. Let's just look for a handout somewhere, okay? Now, with that in mind, let's move on. We see the five laws of divine establishment. What's the next point? Uh, unbelievers produce establishment good when functioning under the law of divine establishment from within the sphere of the flesh. That's what I said earlier. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you don't have to be. You don't have to be in the. Uh, so an unbeliever you, can't be in the right. sphere of the spirit. Yeah, you can't. So you can't assume that their human good in the area of divine establishment is good enough to get them to heaven. That's you exactly know, right. But the truth of the matter is, is this unbeliever can act, actually produce establishment good. And the good is the preservation of human history to the conclusion of the angelic conflict. And for the unbeliever, it's rewardable in time, but there will be no blessing in eternity. That's exactly right. Because he's done, he only has the sphere of the flesh to perform it in. That's exactly right. Now, let's move on from there for just a moment. There are only, uh, uh, these are the only blessings the unbeliever can produce for him or herself. Only see, ones. That's, that's what we just all, talked about. Yeah. That's exactly. See, it yeah. has to come uh -huh. from the laws of divine establishment, and you have to realize what these laws are given to us by God to preserve human history and the human race to the successful conclusion of the angelic conflict to the end of the millennium. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, moving on from there. So it is. It is possible for the unbeliever to be blessed by God even when a believer is residing in the cosmic system and is under divine discipline. So listen to that. So you got an un so you got an unbeliever over here. Yeah. He's, he's functioning in the laws of divine establishment. He's, uh, he's being blessed by God. You got the cosmic believer over here who's carnal and functioning outside the sphere of the spirit and guess what? God's disciplining that person, uh -huh. disciplining the believer Blessing while the unbeliever, unbeliever is getting yep. blessed. His marriage is great and he's functioning in the family and all these divine institutions. And, Absolutely. Uh -huh. But just make sure you realize that the unbeliever can be being blessed while the unbeliever or while the believer is being cursed, you know, with divine discipline. Because he's functioning outside the plan of God. Well, That's exactly yeah. right. 
So yeah. now, now, now we're going to get to the judgment. Oh, okay? yeah. Here's what I want to get to. The judgment of human good. The human good of the church age believers will be judged at the end of the church age at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that happens, and that happens to be at the time of the rapture. Uh -huh. At the time of the rapture of the church, understand day. this. We don't know when yeah, the rapture of the church is going to occur. Secondly, you need to realize that the next prophetic event to be to be manifested uh -huh. is the rapture of the church. Now, if the next prophetic event will be the rapture of the church, there can't be any prophecy fulfilled between now and then. Uh -huh. And we don't know how long it's going to be till the rapture is actually going to occur. So when you're looking at uh, when you look at the scripture and people are telling you on television, in their books, <laughs> in the magazine, wherever, on their and from the pulpit, telling you, hey, prophecy here, prophecy there, prophecy there. No, 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 no. It is an historical. It actually, it's a. Um, oh, gee whiz, my tip just went went that way. Uh, it's a. It's an historical trend. You know what goes around comes around, uh -huh. and you look back over history. It went from bad to good to bad to good to bad to good. But what happens is we move as we move closer to the rapture of the church, moving into the tribulation. It's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. Pressure, 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 pressure. So here we go again. The human good of the church age believer will be judged at the end of the church age, that's the rapture, after the rapture, at the judgment seat of Christ. Remember that. The judgment seat of Christ is called the Bema seat of Christ. Now watch this. Only believers, we're talking about believers only now, from the church age, not believers from the age of the Gentiles, not believers from the age of, uh, the age of uh, Israel, not from the tribulation, but in the church age only, okay? What does Romans 14.10 say? <clears throat> but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now let me talk about something here. To whom is Paul talking at this point in time? To believers. Okay. Uh, and where are they? They're in Rome. In Rome. So he's talking to Roman believers. Uh -huh. But there's an application to all church age believers, okay? Today. And here's what he said. Uh -huh. Hey, church age believer, why are you judging your brother? Now, the brother here is another born-again no, Christian. Believer. Oh, hey, oh, oh so-and-so out here. Oh, sister so-and-so. Look what Christ. she's doing. Hey, listen, God says, why are you judging your brother, mm -hmm. another Christian? He said, or why do you set it not thy brother? Set it not. Oh, we're not having anything more to do with that guy. Okay, hold it just a second. He said, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, let me tell you, uh, let me tell you an erroneous interpretation of that. Okay. People take this. And we're all going to stand there. That means believer and unbeliever. Uh -huh. And what they do is they combine the rapture uh, and, and the the and the, uh, the, the, um, and the yes we they they they, inc second they include advent. here the second advent and the, the and rapture. the the rapture and the great white throne. Uh -huh. They they bring them all, all together. together one, yeah. There's there's no second coming. It's just the rapture called the second coming. There is only one judgment. No bema seat. Just great white throne at the end of human history. Excuse me. Between the rapture of the church going to the great white throne, I'm sorry, the Bema seat. From the Bema seat to the great white throne is a thousand and seven years. Exactly. Okay? A thousand and seven years difference. Only born again Christians will be at the rap at the Bema seat. Unbelievers from every dispensation of time, from Adam outside the garden all the way into human history, will be at the great white throne. Unbelievers only. Now, so that word all here. For we shall all stand. See that all that's misinterpreted to mean every, everybody, yeah. everybody in the human but he race. Was talking about brothers and sisters in context. That's right. It's Christian. going to only be uh -huh. born again Christians. Uh -huh. Period. But every born again. See, you're not going to left out. Be left out. Uh -huh. <laughs> So you may be as carnal as, as you can be. See, well, maybe I can slide out of here and not be so far. <laughs> no, there is no escape. You're going to be there with a resurrection body, and you're going to be stand before Jesus Christ, and your human good is going to be cast into the fire. You're good, both good, divine good, good and human good. Be, be both cast, and we're going to see that in just a moment, okay? okay? So all of us is every born-again right. Christian. Now, how about 2 Corinthians 5.10? This is for, a great passage. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So here's the issue: you're going to stand before Jesus at the, at the beam of seat judgment as a born again Christian in a resurrection, resurrection body, body, and all of your good, human good, divine good, are going to be cast into a fire. 
And the issue, the issue is to find that everyone, everyone, every born again Christian may receive the things done in his body. That's why you're alive, alive physically, uh -huh. according to what you have done, uh -huh. whether it be good uh -huh. or whether it be bad. Now, what we need to do is make sure we understand good what and good and bad are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, oh, yeah, good. That's good out there. It's just all kinds of good. Humanitarian activity, altruism, philanthropy. Uh -huh. Yeah, all kinds of good. And the bad sin. Uh -huh. Excuse me. Not on your life. Here it is. What is it? This verse, good refers to divine good, and bad refers to human good. See? It's not yeah. sin. Yeah, not it's sin. human. Sin's it's not human, the issue here. As, it's human good and divine good. At the beam of seat judgment, your good is going, to be, is going to be evaluated. Is it human good or divine good? Divine good, you're going to be rewarded. Human good, going to burn up, and you get nothing, okay? Now, the believer's life. Yeah, the believer's human good is evaluated and it's burned at the beam of seat judgment. Okay, and what we have here then is 1 Corinthians 3, 1 uh, through 3 again, and without going through all three verses, yeah. what did he say there, Steve? If he speaks in tongues or prophecies or has all faith while residing in the cosmic system, then all that he has done has no spiritual content That's right. and becomes nothing more than human good. That's exactly right. And the last sentence there is what? Uh, can Paul you see says, that? I am nothing. Paul says, I am nothing. A nothing produces what? Human good, which is worthless in the plan of God. That's right. Wood, hay, and stubble. That's exactly, up. That's exactly right. Now, we're done. We're not done yet. But you know, uh, we got, uh, let's see, there's seven. Uh, what? Let's see, we got, uh, let's see, what page are we on now? Like we're on uh, page six. No. I'll tell you what. Let me let me see something here. Well, page six at the bottom there, but I don't know how. If you're guess seven. what? Guess what? We that just finished. It. We just finished. <laughs> Absolutely. Good timing. Good timing. Okay, sure enough. So let's do this, Steve. Uh, why don't you go ahead and pray for us? And we'll re real, real quick, like see who's okay. on live with us up yeah, here, okay. and then we'll have to stop uh, the uh, the recording here on uh, on YouTube. Wow, God, thank you so much for this study. Thank you for taking care of our eternal needs with the salvation through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And thank you for giving us a plan that we can, while we're on earth, earn blessing in time, rewards in eternity for the future. There's a plan and a process for doing it. It's available mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. We just need to do it and live it out. Yes. To resolve the angelic conflict. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm going to stop the stream for... for